for those of us that unfortunately know the pain of grief, one of the emotions that comes to the top of the list is heartbreak. Not only are we heartbroken about the person or the loved one that we lost, but there's also heartbreak over the loss of dreams, goals, aspirations. And so in this episode of Grief Rewritten, Lysandra and I are diving deep into what that looked like for us when we lost our husbands, as well as how we managed and continue to manage our heartbreak. Welcome or welcome back. My name is Alexis and I am a life and grief coach. And on this platform, Becoming All She, we focus on helping young Christian widows rebuild themselves so they can live a life of purpose and fulfillment after loss. Please be sure to like and subscribe to this channel. It really helps encourage us to keep bringing this content to you, as well as push it to other women who may be in need. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into the video. So today we're going to talk a little bit about heartbreak. Um and our widowhood journeys. Um, and we're just going to share a little bit about our journeys. Like, how did we get from point A to where we are right now? And so Alexis is going to share, <laughs> she's going to kick us off with a little bit about her widowhood journey. Um, Alexis, if you could just talk about I know your husband passed in an accident, you know, which I know that just the tragedy of all of that, if you could just kind of share and take us through um, maybe some of the the high the highlights um, and the lowlights, I guess we could say, right? Yeah. Of, yeah. of your journey. Yeah. And I, and I love that you said that, Lissandra, because there are highlights. There are There's a lot of lowlights. But there are highlights. And I think that's part of the grief journey. It, it's not linear. So, you know, there'll be times where you're angry or bargaining um, or depressed. And then there's other times where it's like, OK, I think I think I'm going to be OK. You mm -hmm. know, I'm, I'm ready to rebuild. You start having these thoughts and, and it goes up and down, you know. And so um, so my husband, his name was Sterling. And I'm going to try not to cry because I'm definitely not wearing waterproof mascara. <laughs> but this is just like the truth of what it is. It's been almost three years and I still like, it still pulls on me. It's still heartbreaking, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so Sterling and I were married for three years. We had, well, he actually passed three days before our three year anniversary. It was, wow. it was really... When I look back on it, you can't tell me God's hand wasn't on it because there were just so many signs and symbols. Um, but nevertheless, so Sterling was involved in a car accident when he was driving from our home in South Florida to his hometown of Atlanta. And so uh, somewhere in Southern Georgia, about an hour out, well, I'm not good with geography, so let me know. Yeah. About an hour out of Atlanta in a town called Macon, he had an accident and um, was airlifted and taken to the hospital where he suffered a traumatic brain injury. And I'll spare you all the details. You can find more in my grief journey video that's linked here on my channel. I will post it probably down in the description box. Um, but basically he was in ICU for three months and we were waiting and praying, praying and waiting to see uh, if something would change. But he went without oxygen for about 22 minutes. And so there was just way too much damage to the brain. And we had had end of life conversations prior to the accident. So I was very well aware of what his desires were in terms of end of life care. And so I was traveling back and forth from Florida to Georgia for those three months. My son was three years old at the time. So I was caretaker, nurse, admin three days a week, and then mommy and work. I was still working. So it was a lot. It was so much happening during those three months. And finally, the doctors are like, we need you to make a decision. He cannot stay in ICU any longer. And because I knew his desires, I was like, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm surrendering. I'm trusting that if you're going to, you can do a miracle here, you can do it in hospice. But I know that 
us intervening and prolonging his life when he's not getting better is not what he wants and not what you have for him because I believe in the promise of heaven and eternal life. Um, and Sterling was, he loved God and, and had a relationship. And so there was no doubt in my mind. It was just the reckoning of like, this is really happening and I'm going to, I have to let go. Um, yeah. And not knowing what happened. And so Sterling passed on May 3rd and the number three, three months after his accident. Um, or no, I'm sorry, August 3rd, which was three days before our three year anniversary. Um, and to be honest, it was weird. Like when I got the call, I went to visit him. I got to the hospital. It was, it was a mess, but, um, I had to drive to the hospice facility because they told me it's time he passed an hour after I left because we got there at like one o'clock in the morning. My son was with me. I, you know, I got in the bed with him. I, mm-hmm. I said my final goodbyes and I knew I had to take my son home. I had to take him to our Airbnb. And then I got the call from the facility an hour later that he was gone. Wow. And I remember a sense of relief and I felt guilty for that. Mm. I felt like, why, why am I, why am I okay with this? Mm-hmm. But then I realized that was peace. Mm, my goodness. Wow. That was peace. And, um, from there, I, um, I think my defense mechanism, and I talk about this in my video was I'm just, I'm going to act like not that it didn't happen, but like it's happened and it's done. Like the chapter is open and closed. Yeah. And we know that that's <laughs> not it. It never closes. <laughs> <laughs> it never closes. Yeah. And so um, for a year, I went on this path of this like rampage of I'm superwoman. I'm going to take care of my son. I don't need anybody's help. I got this. I'm good. Yeah. And on the surface, it, and I don't know, I can't say it looked like that. Cause I like cut off all my hair. I lost like 30 pounds, but in my mind, I thought I was good. <laughs> <laughs> I went back to work three months later. Like I was like, I'm, I'm good. And my, my coworkers at the time at that job would shout out to them. Cause they were so supportive. I don't work there anymore, but they were really great to me and to my family. And they're like, are you sure? You're sure. ready to come back? And I'm like, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. And I was traveling. I mean, it was really looking back at it. I was out of my mind with grief mm-hmm. and not dealing with it. And mm-hmm. so I got really sick. I was like, my mental health suffered. I was mm-hmm. an insomniac. I was anxious. If I didn't take sleep aids, I would be up for 36 to 48 hours at a time. It was that bad. Okay. Um, I had suicidal ideation where, because I was dealing with so much in my marriage and not having that closure, I was just like, I don't want to be here, but I knew I couldn't leave my son. Yeah. He was like my saving grace because when I was like, I don't have anything, there's, I don't have anything to live for. I would be reminded of him. And so, um, yeah, after about a year of that, Mm -hmm. I finally reckoned with like, if I don't do something, I'm not going to make it like literally, Um, I'm going to have a heart attack. Something's going to happen. Like um, I felt it and I felt the spirit telling me that like, you need to, you need to do something. And uh, so my cousin would shout out to her, my best friend, love her to death. Shout out to T. Uh, she was like, you know, why don't you come out to Denver? Cause we were still living in Miami at the time. Why don't you come out to Denver? Just hang out for the weekend, bring Mason with you. And a three day trip turned into a week long trip. And Lissandra, I, in that week, I didn't have to take my sleep aids not once. Mm, okay. And there was a piece, and this was like in the midst of COVID too. Yeah. Like, let's not forget about that. Um, and I remember it like it was yesterday. I was flying back home to Miami. It was a Sunday. The plane hit the runway at MIA. And the Lord said so gently, but loudly, "Yeah, you can't stay here your healing isn't going to happen here. Wow. 
the next day I quit my job. Well, I gave my notice. I didn't just do that like that. I gave my notice. And three weeks later, I was moving to Denver. And it has been an incredible healing journey since then. And and not just healing, but restoration. Mm -hmm. Like God bringing back tenfold everything that I've lost. And that has been, I mean, there's been such an awakening and just kind of seeing how through the different stages of grief that I had to go through with, you know, just the shock of the accident, you know, there were times where I'm like, is this happening? Is this my life? Like the denial of it. Um, And then just kind of moving in and out of the different feelings of like pain and anger and bargaining. And then finally, finally getting into a place where I'm like, I can I've, I have, I'm giving myself permission to rebuild, to reconstruct yeah. this new chapter of my life. Um, it's, it's, it's been an, it's been incredible. Yeah. <laughs> honestly, <laughs> honestly, it has been. Um, wow. And I'm just so grateful because what's, what has happened. Oh, there's my dog. <laughs> what has happened is. God has brought in community. Like that has been a really pivotal. And that was, that was where the shift happened. Like my cousin came in and redirected me. And then when I got to Denver, I got plugged in and then I met you and the rest of the group when I was here in Denver. And so, you know, community, community and that support, um, I just see God's hand in it and how he sent different people into my life to, to guide me and lead me. What, what, I, cause I, I feel like, and I remember being there, people want to know what was your timeline off it. And I, I was the same way. So you said for a year, you were trying to handle everything on your own. Yeah. And yeah. After the year, that was your turning point, right? Yeah. Like everything you started to, when you moved to, the, to Denver. Yeah. Um, and now you, it's been two years since you've been there, right? Yeah, just about in September, it will be two okay. years that I've been here in Denver. It's been a year and a half. And in August, so August will be three years since okay. Sterling passed. And then September will be two years that I've been in Denver. You've been in Denver. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, in terms of like your healing journey, I know being there with your cousin and you said finding community, what were the other key factors that allows you to start to break through? Mm. I think each and every single one of us, it's not, I don't know if it's spelled out in the stages of grief, but I think surrender is mm-hmm. My goodness. really a key fact, especially as Christian widows, I can't speak that for everyone. I know, but I know as a Christian, and the thing is, I think it's really important to define surrender. I I can't claim this definition as my own, but I'm going to say it. I heard it said um, by a friend of mine, surrender is not, I'm useless. Surrender is giving God what you have so he can make use of it. And Mm -hmm. for me, what I had to give was heartbreak was uncertainty, pain. That's what I have, God. That's, that's what, that's the truth. That's what I have. And saying, I don't want to hold on to this anymore because it's making me sick. Yeah. Poison. And so God, I'm going to hand this over to you. Yeah. Do with it what you will. That is surrender to me. Um, Wow. And when you do that, I believe God honors that. Yeah. And God takes that and says, let me, let me fix that for you. Let me make that beautiful because I love you and because I care. And because that is my promise to you that I will do that. And so it was a, it was a slow process because again, in terms of faith, when you add the faith component, you know, there's that age old question of like, why do bad things have to happen? Why do people have to die? And when we look at it from the common sense of man, it deteriorates the character of God. Mm. So what would make sense to us in our limited understanding as human, as human beings, as man, 
yo, God, God can do exceedingly and abundantly beyond what we can comprehend. And it's yes. like the beauty that has come out of the loss of my husband. I'm a completely different person today yeah, because I loved and lost that I wouldn't be this person today if that didn't happen. And knowing at the same time that while this tragedy, this was a tragedy, like my husband is celebrating in a mansion right now. Mm-hmm. And hopefully not anytime soon, mm-hmm. I will be there, with him. you know, like I will see him again. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's leaning into that truth that my faith gives me standing on that truth. Um, Man, so surrender, faith, you know, leaning into those promises. Yeah. Um, and I think just acknowledging, acknowledging what's happening. You know, like I mentioned earlier, for me, it was like, I'm not dealing with this. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Oh, but how many people are doing that? Yeah. Men and women, right? Not just widows, but it, all other all kinds of grief. How many people are avoiding dealing with the issues and the pain and the heartache um of grief? Right. So I, I mean, I I, I honestly um, I just appreciate you sharing that part of it because I feel like so many people are kind of just running around in denial or running around like they have to be super, a super super Christian or super mom or super dad and not, or running around telling themselves, I'm fine. I'm fine. I got it. Yeah. But they're not, they're not okay. Right. And it seems like too, from your story too, sometimes it, it takes rock bottom. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, you know, we, culture is kind of, it, it shifts, right? Whether yeah. it's generationally every few years. And so we have we're coming to this season of like self-care And I, I love it, but I think there's a danger in it in that the self-care piece, I think the worldly mantra is like, do you for you? And it's like, no, we need you to do you because we need you. We need your contributions. We need you to serve like your self-care in terms of your healing process, your healing journey doesn't end with you. Like. I'm still in the healing process, but I have come to a place where I recognize the spirit leading me and saying, no, like we need you to, I think you shared this in our first video. We need you to reach back. Mm -hmm. You have sisters coming up behind you that have experienced or are experiencing the same loss that you did three years ago. You need, you need to help bring them out of the fold too. Um, and so that's kind of like, I think going back and serving because there's ministering that happens when you serve too. Mm -hmm. Even in conversations that you and I have had, there's (laughs) revelation that comes out of it and having that conversation. So it's a perpetual um, uh, journey that, that happens. And so, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of different pieces and each, 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 Each person has their individual journey, but I think that community coming in together and just having people that can rally around you is what really makes all of these other pieces make sense. Yeah. 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 I really hope you enjoyed that video. You know, there's something that's um, so healing about talking about my story, even three years post loss. And my hope and prayer for you is that through sharing this story and having these conversations that you can find healing and restoration too. If you're looking to join a community to continue these conversations, look in the description box, click the link below to join my Becoming All She Facebook group where we come together. We have these, we continue these conversations online and you can also have a direct link to me. You can also schedule a one-on-one breakthrough sessions to dive deeper into your personal story and maybe I can help along the way. Now, if you would like to see part two of this video where Lysandra shares her side of the story, I'll also leave the link below to her channel where you can catch the second part of the episode. We love you. We're so happy that we're here and remember, 
Be good to yourself so you can be kind to someone else. We'll see you next week.